Hey, it's Rocky Lalvani, the Profit Answer Man. The goal of this podcast is to help you, the business owner, understand your financial numbers so you can make better decisions. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes 3 through 13. Episode 1 is the why and how of what we do and why I'm here. Today, I have a guest, and you're going to hear a couple of numbers, guys, help non-numbers people with how to look at the numbers and be more comfortable in your business. Spencer has a system that's different from Profit First. I want to share as many ways as possible to help you survive and thrive. Spencer Shinen is the author of the book, Entrepreneur Numbers, and he is joining us today to share his system. Let's meet our guest. Hello, Spencer, and welcome to the Profit Answer Man podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, Rocky. Uh, really looking forward to this. So today we're going to talk numbers from a numbers standpoint for the people who don't like numbers. Before we do that, let's chat a little bit about your background. Can you tell people how you came to be where you're at today? Sure. I have a bit of maybe an unusual path. I am a, a CPA back in the day in Canada. It was called a CA. And so I'm a CPA CA, which was way back in the mid 90s. And uh, the funny part, which is going to tie back in later, is, is I actually really hated going through the accounting program. I did not like, I, I physically went to work nauseous. And so after I got my accounting degree, you know, I was kind of at that point where you just have to finish what you've started. And I would, you know, accounting is, it's a good degree to have. So I finished it and I went on, I I'd spent a year as an investment banking analyst and spending most of that year working from about 7 a.m. till 2 a.m. on transactions and financings. I decided that wasn't for me anyway, either. And through a, a series of coincidences and mistakes, I would almost say, I ended up uh, acquiring a business with my then business partner. Um, he, he came to me, he was a friend, and he said, hey, let's go find a business to buy together. And, you know, having been unhappy doing the accounting thing and not really liking the investment banking thing, I always knew I would be in business. Somehow, some way I would be in business. And he asked, I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so for me, like the, the transaction was relatively easy from my experience. Understanding the numbers was relatively easy. And uh, I was 26 at the time, so I was really young. And it was a manufacturing business. We made skincare products, highly regulated. We were regulated by regulatory authorities in Canada and the U.S. <clears throat> and I had no idea what I was doing, like literally zero. And I, I had that business for 15 years believe it or not. And we ended up uh, quadrupling the revenue. Um, we had uh, a facility, a 50,000 square foot warehouse. We supplied, we did contract uh, manufacturing and private label brands for all of the major retailers in Canada and a bunch in the US. And so it was a really interesting ride. And along the way, my partner there actually owned another business, which was a, a construction business. And when his partner retired, he invited me into that business. And the goal was we were going to kind of, our goal was to actually acquire several businesses, implement management teams and kind of be the, the mini Warren Buffets, you know, where we have our fingers in a bunch of pies. And uh, that's when 2008 hit, which was a challenge for many of us in business. And um, I was also involved in a family business at the time, which was a, a cold storage business. We had four uh, public refrigerated warehouses. So think just dry warehouse storage, but frozen. Uh, we had uh, four facilities in Washington State. So I was involved in these three businesses at 2008 and um, obviously had to make some changes. There's lots of economic challenges. We we sold the, the cold storage business <clears throat> to a private equity firm that was rolling up that business. My partner and I decided to split up the businesses. We're still friends today. It just we had different goals and we were doing different things at the time. So he took the construction business. I stayed with the manufacturing business for another few years and ultimately sold that to a competitor in the East who folded our business into theirs and um, ended up at uh, around the age of 40 wondering what I was going to do next. And, um, you know, committed to taking a year off because I spent a lot of time actually unhappy in my different businesses. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, ended up just doing some advisory work for different people. Excuse me. And 
Uh, it was really interesting. I was I was working with a bunch of tech startups and they kept asking me to be their CFO because it would bring credibility to their team because they'd have a CPA, et cetera, et cetera. I could help with fundraising. And I kept running into the exact same problem, which is I couldn't get the most basic financial information from their bookkeepers. And I'm like, I, like I'm literally asking for the most basic thing. Or they would ask me questions that I'm like, how can you be asking me this? Like, this is this is below 101 level. And uh, through just a, a series of uh, more coincidences and conversations, I ended up recognizing that I could actually solve that pain for a lot of these entrepreneurs who not only didn't know that they had a problem, they didn't know how to solve it either. It was a bit of a classic, don't know what you don't know. And uh, I ended up hiring a couple of people that I worked with at the manufacturing business we set up kind of what, what I'm doing now, which is, you know, we make accounting not suck for entrepreneurs. Um, I know how much accounting sucks. I hated it. But I also understand the power in the numbers and understanding, like, if you really get the right stories inside the financials launched for you, um, it's a game changer. So, yeah, I just I was inspired. I love working with entrepreneurs. You know, my why is I, I believe entrepreneurs can change the world. And my role is to help them through their financial blind spot. So that's what we do now. We help entrepreneurs through their financial blind spot uh, through my business. And, you know, that was the biggest shocking thing for me was when I found out that business owners didn't understand the business of business and weren't looking at their financial statements. I'm like, what mm -hmm. are you talking about? How is it you're not looking like how do you run a business without looking at the numbers? And when I realized that and I and I knew my natural skill sets, which are spreadsheets and in systems and being able to take those complicated when i look at numbers and spreadsheets and tax returns i see stories like i feel exactly it. and yeah. so i'm like i can really help people survive and thrive so question for you why did you pick accounting if you hate the whole thing yeah, I mean, when I so this was coming out of university, um, I did a, an undergraduate degree in history <laughs> um, because I didn't know what else to do at the time. And in my last year, I was talking to my dad. I'm like, well, what am I going to do next? Like, I, I don't I don't know. Um, and he's a CPA. He's a tax specialist. He's like, well, there's this thing called the chartered accountant program. I'm like, oh, OK. And I literally applied and got in and I had to make up a bunch of courses because I was a history major. And. Honestly, it's because I didn't know what else to do other than I always knew I wanted to be involved in business somehow. But, you know, I mean, I was whatever, 19 or 20 at the time. I, I didn't know. So I just kind of followed a path somewhat blindly. And even though I didn't like the day to day of accounting and I didn't like the <clears throat> I didn't like the routine aspect of accounting, it, it was just so informative that kind of like you, when I look at financials now, I see the story I don't see a, uh, an income statement. I see a story. And that's what's really exciting for me now. But the good news is I don't have to do the day-to-day -day accounting. I have team members that love accounting, and they do the accounting for the clients. I don't have to do that. I am part of the story. And that's very true. And I found, and, and this happens in all parts of life, but the people who you think are the experts aren't really the experts, and they picked so they picked going to be a CPA because they thought it would be a good life and they could make good money. But if you don't have that natural talent to feel the numbers, mm -hmm. you're a you're a mismatch for that that particular space. My wife's a CPA. She's okay. not the reason we're wealthy. Right. She's <laughs> really good at putting things where they belong and, and handling the tax returns and and making sure that you maximize that. But she's not about building wealth. And so. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure you know who you're listening to and whether they truly can help you understand the numbers. So let's just define a couple of terms because I think people get confused. So there's yeah. the, there's a CFO, there's a controller, there's a CPA, and there's a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are the roles of each of those positions? I always like using an analogy of building a house because it's super clear. And one of the problems when you were talking about your wife and what she does is there's different accountants have different areas of what they do. <clears throat> and a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand that difference and end up going to the wrong person for the wrong thing. So if you picture, if you want to go out and build a house, kind of everybody immediately knows without being told about it, you're going to have a general contractor is the person you're going to be dealing with. 
<clears throat> they run the whole job. They hire everybody else. They're your go-to person. Below them, they've got all the sub-trades, the, the electricians, the plumbers, the carpenters, et cetera. Those are skilled people. They have schooling, training, and they specialize in certain areas. And at the bottom of what I call the, the work stack is the laborer. You know, they might be ha hauling bags of cement, hauling lumber, digging ditches, cleaning up, kind of the most basic routine stuff. So if you overlay that on an accounting department, you know, you've got the top, you know, your CFO, they might be director of finance, might be VP finance, depending on the size of the company. That's like the general contractor. They're responsible for everything that happens in that department. And they're really looking, they should be looking at your world strategically, <clears throat> helping you understand the impact of your decisions through a financial lens. The CFO, the director of finance, the VP finance, they're helping you look at your business through a, finan uh, a financial lens strategically. So if you're going to change your pricing model, if you're going to open another store, if you're going to launch a new division, they're going to help you see in three to five years what your finance looks like. Below that, the, the sub-trades equivalent, that's your controller. That's the person who's responsible not only for your financial reporting, but also the, the, the compliance. And that's the part that gets overlooked a lot. And that's things like, I hate to say it, but your accounting systems and processes or SOPs, that's selecting the right software. That's your chart of accounts or the blueprints of your business. So, and they're overseeing the bookkeeper. So those are tend to be more specialized people. And at the bottom of the stack is the bookkeeper. And the bookkeeper is someone who's doing the day-to-day -day transactions, your invoicing, your receivables, your payables, payroll, that type of thing. So one of the big problems that happens is a lot of entrepreneurs, especially smaller ones, rely exclusively on a bookkeeper to build their entire accounting department, which is really the same as hiring a, a laborer to build you a house. You would never build a house without the specialty of a contractor and subtrades. But a lot of people rely on the bookkeeper to do everything. That's where we get in trouble. And then the external CPA is going to do things like your taxes, your year-end reporting. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs also rely on their external accountants for that advice. Well, the reality is external accountants, there are some that are incredible with advice, but a lot of their skill set, they're trained to do year-end in taxes. They're, they're not trained on strategic advice. So if you've just got a bookkeeper, an external CPA, and you're looking for somebody to give you those stories, that's where some of this pain comes in. That's where some of the, the frustration comes in from the, from, for the entrepreneurs. And that's a big part of it, because especially if you're a small entrepreneur, you are the CFO and the controller. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sitting in those seats and you're not comfortable in them, which from what I'm told, 80% of business owners are not comfortable in that seat. And it, it makes sense because they didn't want to be an accountant. Mm -hmm. You need to get help and you need to put somebody in that seat that can work for you. And for the small business owner, that's where having the fractional person who only worked for you a couple hours a, a month comes in and can help you and make sure that you built the house correctly and then delegate everything out to your bookkeeper and keep an eye on your bookkeeper. Because again, if you don't know what you're looking at, you can't keep track of your bookkeeper, which brings up the question, how do you know if you have a bad bookkeeper? Yeah, it's a great question. And even before that, if I can say, I mean, you mentioned 80% of entrepreneurs are sitting in those roles and don't know how to do it. It's actually kind of worse than that. There was a study where over 10,000 entrepreneurs, small and medium entrepreneurs said accounting and taxes was the worst part of owning a business. So not only do they not have the skills to deal with it, they don't like dealing with it and end up avoiding it. And it's the avoidance and not getting in and solving this root problem the way you were sort of talking about having somebody who can give you that advice and helping you know. Um, uh, yeah, it just ends up feeding this vicious cycle. So it's, it's a real area of struggle for a lot of entrepreneurs. And so, you know, if you're in that boat of not being on top of your numbers, you are not alone. This is a huge, huge problem. And so, uh, sorry, I just wanted to throw that in. I hope you don't mind. Uh, but in terms of how do you know if you have a good bookkeeper or not, you know, the problem of being, I don't actually even know what to ask. I'm going to offer a few questions that you could ask. And even if you don't know the answer, you can sort of judge by their reply on if it's, uh, if they're on top of it. The first thing, this is really, really basic is ask to see a copy of the latest 
bank reconciliation and credit card reconciliations. If you're using a cloud-based system, they should be able to take you to a screen that says when the last reconciliation was done, and it should be within a couple weeks of the end of the month. A good bookkeeper will be like a few days. If it's within a couple weeks, that's cool. If they can't show you something that's several months, that is a huge red flag. And if you're on a desktop version or maybe not as sophisticated, they should be able to at least show you a piece of paper where it's reconciled within the last couple of weeks, a spreadsheet in Excel, whatever. Um, that's sort of number one. If they can't do that, that's a red flag. Number two is checking if you're on a cash basis of accounting or a cruel basis of accounting. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of that. It's really accountant nerdy stuff. But the, the super short version is if you take deposits from your customers and you're calling that income when you receive it, there's a good chance your numbers aren't going to make sense. There's in order to get the good stories out of the books, you really need to have your 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 the money that comes in aligned with when you're doing the work, when you quote unquote earn it. Because you don't actually earn the money when the money comes in. You earn it by doing the work. So if you're not, if they say you're on a cash basis of accounting, that's a red flag too. If you're on accrual, that's cool. And if you are on accrual, you can ask to see, like show me the prepaid amortization schedule. Insurance is a great example. Just for easy math, we're going to say your insurance is $12,000 for the year. If you see a charge for $12,000 in August, that's a problem. You need to see it $1,000 a month because you're using that insurance all year. It's kind of the reverse of what my last example of getting a deposit. That's you actually giving a deposit for your insurance. So again, that's a red flag if they do not have a prepaid amortization schedule. Even if you don't know what you're looking at, that's cool because you know you're seeing some red flags. Um, and I'll give you one other is probably one of the most important things you can get. And this is where the stories come from or one of the big stories is always going to come from profitability by segment or however you think of your business. If you have different service lines, product lines, you're going to want to make sure that your bookkeeper has the book set up in a way that you can understand profitability we're going to call it gross margin or gross contribution. Even if you don't know what those mean, ask for that. Show me gross contribution by, by, by service line. Going back to my construction example, let's say you're in construction. You have a, a new homes division, a reno division, and a um, tenant improvement division. Um, you should be able to look at what is my gross margin in each of those divisions. And if your bookkeeper doesn't have the book set up in a way you can do that, and however you intuitively think about your business. If you have a store and you're selling, I don't know, I'm thinking of a conversation I had recently where there's, you know, they have purses, is handbags is one category, and jewelry is a category, and clothing is a category. You should be able to look at each of those categories to know which one is making you the most profit. So if they can't deliver those few things, that's a pretty big red flag to me that maybe you don't have the basics covered. And that's big part of it too is knowing to ask your bookkeeper for that type of information and to do it consistently and look at it. So that's one of the things I just did recently with one of my clients. I actually went into their SKUs and started looking at things and showing it to them and, and we got some big red flags because he's like, oh, we're selling some products at or very close to cost. I can't make money if that's the case. This is silly to sell something and essentially get nothing for it. So he had to go in and fix his his costs within the system so that he was appropriately pricing his products. And I know most business owners don't want to do this, and that's fine. Make sure somebody's doing it. Either if you have an internal person, great. If you don't have an internal person, get somebody in the seat because there is nothing worse than growing revenue that's not profitable or worst case is actually at a loss. You will, you will grow yourself into bankruptcy and, and it happens more often than you think. We, we've both seen that with various clients where, yeah, I mean, the, the, I've seen so many clients that are actually growing and their profit is either going down or getting to be a bigger loss because they're going after the wrong stuff because they don't know which parts of their business are actually making the money. Totally. A hundred percent agree with you. And that's a big part of, of what we do is, is helping you see what's profitable so you can put your efforts where the most profits are and, and pivot. 
And the cool thing is most of the profit is coming from your best customers. And most of your headaches are coming from the worst customers. And we help you figure that out and look at that. So you wrote the book, Entrepreneur Numbers, The Surprisingly Simple Path to Financial Clarity. And in that, you talk about a couple of things. I know you talk about hygiene and insights. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by those words? So I actually think the way accounting has been designed and developed over the last, I don't know, 100 years, 150 years, I, I don't know the history of accounting that well, but I actually think it's really broken for entrepreneurs. You know, it was designed for guys like you and me that went to school and trained and learned how to read, interpret, create, write financial statements, whereas most entrepreneurs didn't. Like, it's a different language. So I think about the hygiene is the day-to-day -day basic stuff of accounting. It's all of the stuff that entrepreneurs hate. It's all of the transactions, the reports, and that type of thing. But here's the thing. I don't think hygiene is for you, the entrepreneur. The hygiene is for the accountants and the lawyers and the bankers and that type of thing. It's like the bathroom in a restaurant. You actually, if you think about it that way, if you're the, if you own a restaurant, your bathroom isn't for you. It's for your customers. It's for your staff. And if you're in the restaurant and you need to use the, the facilities, you'll use it. But it's really not for you. It's for other people. Same as the hygiene of your accounting. That's all of the transactions. That's even your financial statements. That's the hygiene. And you've got to get it right the same way as a bathroom in a restaurant has to be clean. Yeah, the pain. I'm sorry. I know you hate doing it, but you still got to get it right. You've got to make sure you've got a good bookkeeper. You've got to make sure they're current. But they're not for you. The insights is the stories that we we've been talking about, Rocky. It's the it's the 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 key elements within the hygiene that is actually designed for the entrepreneur. And so uh, I'm going to give you know, that's the way I describe it is what are the three biggest issues facing your business through a financial lens? And if you can't rank order those by the impact on either the cash or profit of the business, you don't have your stories dialed. And what ends up happening, lacking insights, is as an entrepreneur, we end up shotgunning and solving all the problems. But if you knew with clarity that, for example, your labor is too high and it's costing you $80,000 a year, now I can go solve an, solve an $80,000 problem rather than worrying we spent an extra $500 in office expenses this year, this month. Bad example, not a lot of office expenses these days, but you get the point. And so how do we tease out of the, the hygiene, and this is not the entrepreneur's job, this is the right uh, accounting resources job, to get you those top three insights in a way that is simple and intuitive to understand. And if I can just take one minute, I'll give you an example of a, of a live um, uh, insight that completely transformed a business. So this was a marketing agency and they had uh, 97 jobs in the prior 12 months. So we'll call it 100 jobs for round numbers. 57 of those, again, round numbers, 60% of their jobs, 60% of their jobs, that's every job you have to win, quote, uh, staff, troubleshoot. You mentioned your small, your small clients are the problem. So you're, you're dealing with complaints on these small clients. 60%. Six out of every 10 jobs was representing 8% of their revenue. Eight. We ended up changing their minimum requirement for a job. Their average revenue per job went from 25 grand to over 50 because we cut out the bad ones. In two and a half new clients, they covered all of what they lost in 60 jobs. They replaced 60 jobs worth of revenue with two and a half new clients. It was three, obviously, but two and a half was actually what it took to replace those eight, uh, those 60 jobs and completely transform their business. They actually moved the bottom line in this business, which was about a $3 million business, by $800,000 by focusing on the right clients. That's the power of insights. They completely changed. They'd been around for years floundering because they didn't know which clients were profitable. And as an entrepreneur, when you hear that, 60% of our jobs gave us 8% of our revenue. You don't have to be an accountant to know that's a problem. It's intuitive. It's simple. 
but you have to know that. You have to know that story. And if you don't know how to figure that out, then help get help yeah. to find that story. Because think about it. If I could get rid of 60% of my job, I could gain 60% of my time, and I could replace it with 10% of my time. I've got half the business with two, three, four times the revenue. That is golden. It, like now you can go play with your kids, enjoy life, go on vacation, enjoy the fruits of the labor and what you've done in your business instead of struggling and killing yourself. It, it's just so game changing. And I mean, the, you know, another really simple example um, and another live one is, is another client that labor was their biggest cost. And, you know, looking visually on a chart with a line going up that showed revenue, uh, uh, the cost of labor has gone up by 4% over the last two years as a percent of sales. Said another way, every dollar you sell, you're making 4% less because you're spending it on labor. Well, that was an $82,000 problem for this client. And as soon as they knew that was the problem, they got all the heads together, they figured out how to solve it, they, they, they managed uh, labor differently, they, they, they took action and solved an $80,000 problem because they knew they had that rather than, again, shotgunning on, oh, we, we spent an extra $500 on travel this month. Well, who cares if you've got an $80,000 problem, problem you need to solve? And that's a big part of what I do is I focus on, you know, the 80-20 rule that, you know, 20% represents 80% of the problem and focus on the 20%, not on the 80, because you're not going to get the leverage that you need. The, the, so we keep, the, the, go ahead. Let, let me just share one thing on that. So the Pareto principle, you know, other, other name for that you may have heard. And so one of the things like I hate how accounting systems do their reporting. I think it's designed for you and me, the accounts. It's not designed for the entrepreneur. We actually, because I was so frustrated, we built our own reporting software that takes the information out of QuickBooks Online, as an example, and turns it into more of this insight. And exactly what you were talking about, that Pareto, um, the 80-20 rule, um, that's one of the standard reports that I think every single entrepreneur needs to be looking at is rank ordering whether it's by client, by job, by division, by department, however you naturally think about your business and literally rank ordering it from the most profitable to the least profitable. And you can build a nice pretty chart with it and there's examples I'm happy to share with you. But like even if you can just look, what are my, almost every time, if you have 100 jobs or customers, look at the top 10, 20, look at the bottom 10, 20, almost guaranteed you're going to have an 80-20 rule of some sort. The example I gave was a 60-40 rule. Uh, it still made a huge impact, like game-changing. So I love that report you just mentioned. I think that's one of the most critical reports every entrepreneur needs to be looking at. And they do. And we've been talking about how financials tell a story. And we also know that a picture can tell a story of a thousand words in a moment. And I know that that's how you help people is you provide pictures to them mm -hmm. so that they can intuitively see what's going on in their business instead of, as you said, accounting systems are designed for reporting and for taxes. They're not designed to help you be profitable, and you've got to learn how to play that gap. So how do you use pictures and charts to, to make it easier for the entrepreneur? I think the best way to think about that is if you picture kind of a basic stock chart that we've all seen a million times and you can see the stock going up and down, up and down, up and down. Then if you own that stock and you look at it and you see a big dip, and obviously in the last little bit, we've seen a huge dip, a huge recovery. There's a lot of bouncing going on right now. But if you see a huge dip, you don't have to be a, a, a stockbroker to know what's going on. You see that dip and it instantly instantly you can know there's a problem with the stock um, or your portfolio just went down. So now think about it the same way, but in terms of your accounting information. And if we take those stories that we were talking about and put them into picture form like a stock chart where you can look at and we're going to say, for example, we'll take your uh, gross margin, one of the most critical numbers that I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. If you can just watch your gross margin and better yet gross margin by segment or area of your business and you see one of them trending down the wrong way, you don't have to be an accountant to know you have a problem. You know, take expenses, you, you know, picture a stock chart where you've got it going up and down 
you've got this year, you've got compared to last year as a, another line. And if you're doing a good enough to have a budget, you now have these three stock lines and you can be as simple as, are my expenses above or below last year? Are my expenses above or below budget? You don't have to be an accountant. You don't have to be staring at financial statements to see how you're performing. So with some support, and there's a bunch of tools and examples at entrepreneurnumbers.com, free downloads where you can see the type of reporting that I'm talking about, where there's different charts. And actually, like I believe an entrepreneur in 15 minutes or less, once a month with the right reporting package can completely understand their financial position and understand the key issues facing the business, those top three insights we were talking about without looking at financial statements, as long as the right pictures are put in front of them. You know, pictures worth a thousand words. I think a picture's worth a thousand dollars. <laughs> and it's true. And it, the problem is the entrepreneur's got to put the time and effort into building the systems and making sure that the accounting systems are set up and all of these things get done. Yes and, and no. And that's where so, they struggle. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, I totally yeah. agree. One of the concepts in entrepreneur numbers and that I like to speak about is it's actually not about you going out and doing it as the entrepreneur. It's a bit about empowering the entrepreneur to know what questions to ask and to know what information to ask from their accountants, bookkeepers, controllers, whatever their accounting stack looks like. And so if they're not getting the information, which is a huge problem, and it's difficult if you're a smaller business to get this information, like if you go and do take that download and be like, give me this package, your bookkeeper might be like, are you crazy? But at least you know what you're striving for now. You know what questions to ask. You know the type of information. Once you arm yourself with this, you don't need to build those accounting systems because you're never going to do it. But you can at least arm yourself to be empowered enough to ask the questions. I mean, super quick example, like take SEO, for example, search engine optimization. I know nothing about it. I don't even know what to ask. I just know, do I show up on the first page of Google or not? It's kind of the same thing. It's like you don't need to know how the black box behind SEO works. You just need to know, am I showing up on the first page of Google? If I'm not, I don't know how to solve it, but that's okay because I will keep going to different experts and keep asking people and keep going to whether it's mastermind groups or, or other entrepreneur groups, uh, mentors, whatever, until I solve that problem. So your challenge is finding the right resources and support to get that, not to actually go out and put those, that's my opinion, not to do it yourself. Because honestly, most entrepreneurs will never get there if they try and do it themselves. Well, and that's, so I do a lot of stuff with high school students, college students. And mm -hmm. the number one question I always ask in their classes is, can you tell me the difference between an entrepreneur and a business owner? And most of them don't get it. Entrepreneurs know they have things that need to get done mm -hmm. and they put people in the seat to do it. Mm -hmm. They empower people to get jobs done. They don't do anything themselves. Business owners slog and try to do everything themselves. And that's why they're working 60 hours a week in their business and they have no money at the end of the week because they refuse to let go mm -hmm. and they refuse to put experts in those seats. And to me, that is the classic problem is people don't realize that you shouldn't be a business owner. You should be an entrepreneur and let go and let the right people who are the experts at what they do run your business and take care of things so you can go enjoy time with your family and kids and go on vacations and do all those things. That's the classic you know, quintessential thing there said another way, right? Like working on the business instead of in the business. If you're in the business doing the jobs, you're never going to get to working on it and building the strategy and, and, and the right people, as you talked about, I, that's kind of my language around exactly what you said, not my language. I didn't invent that by any means, but I, I couldn't agree more. Um, if you're stuck in the business doing all of everybody else's jobs, yeah, you'll be stuck forever. In business, there are certain things that we can control, and we need to learn to control what is controllable in within our realm. And I know in the book you talk about levers, and the levers that you talk about are sales, cost of goods sold, and expenses. Can you explain these levers and their importance and how we control them? Yeah, my, my good friend Archimedes once said, give me, a, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it, and I can move the world. The same thing is if you apply leverage to the right parts of your business, you can move the business. And 
If you think about an income statement, just picture a profit and loss statement, income statement, whatever you call it, P&L, in your mind, some of them are really long and complex and confusing. And I don't care how big or small your business is, what industry you're in, what you sell, services, products, doesn't matter. There's always just the same five elements. And you mentioned three of those. You've got sales minus your cost of goods equals your gross profit minus your operating costs equals your profit. So one, assuming your hygiene right and your income statement is right, the reality is there's only three ways that you can impact your profitability. Number one is increasing sales, and that's either through price or new customers, new products, new services. You can decrease your cost of goods or hold that steady as your sales grow. But if you decrease your cost of goods, you'll increase your profit. Or if you decrease your operating costs or hold those steady as your sales grow, those are the only three areas. And the whole point of the top three insights and the whole point of the reporting package example that's at entrepreneurnumbers.com is it's trying to drive you to one of those three areas that you need to fix. And because entrepreneurs, if you're not feeling good about your numbers, it's overwhelming. There's too much, too many things I don't know. So if you can keep bringing it back to, is sales my biggest problem? Is cost of goods my biggest problem? And that usually means labor materials. Or is my operating cost my biggest problem? Those three things take the complexity out of the financial statements by having, like we were talking about before, those pictures. Pictures on those key levers lets you then know where to focus. And you know, just to bring a tiny bit more complexity on the balance sheet, For most businesses, especially smaller businesses, it's going to be accounts receivable, accounts payable, and inventory. You could argue that either debt and capital assets are other levers that you can pull, but for smaller businesses, it tends to be just those six. So if you can simplify your world down to those six, again, examples uh, available free download, that should help you really understand, you know, A, what the story is, and B, where to apply the story to the business and how it fits. It just makes it takes so much of the noise out for the entrepreneur. And that's a big problem. We get distracted by shiny objects and noise and we don't focus on what's important. Mm -hmm. And that is the key. Focus on what is important. So I know you mentioned this a little bit, but if people would like to connect with you, find out your systems, check out your website, where and how should they do that? Cool. Thank you. Um, Two ways. Number one, entrepreneurnumbers.com. There's a bunch of free downloads. A few of the things we talked about today are available as free downloads. Um, uh, that's one resource people can use. And the other, feel free to connect with me directly at spencer at shiftfinancial.co, not .com, shiftfinancial.co. Uh, somebody, I think, reserved the .com and was holding it for ransom, and I don't pay website ransom, so it's just a, <laughs> a, 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 a principle of mine. And uh, for the, I'll tell you what, for the first five people that mention this podcast, what I'll do is I mentioned I have a, a system. If you're on QuickBooks Online or Zero, I have a system that will actually suck your data in and then spit out your information in the form that's presented in the book and those free downloads. I will do that for you along with a free consulting session to give you my impression and show you what I see um, in your financials. So for the first five people that mention this podcast, to Spencer at shiftfinancial.co. I'm happy to do that as a as a giveaway. And thank you to you, Rocky, for having me on your podcast. You are welcome. And so essentially, we are competitors in that we do the same thing, but I don't compete with anyone. No. And what I tell people is do what works for you. One of the principles of profit first is cutting costs. If you can get a free assessment, take it, yeah. right? Be one of those five. Go get a free assessment. Go go check it out. If it works for you, great. If not, pick another system. I don't care whether you do business with me, Spencer. Go put somebody in the seat and fix your financial problems because you need to. Without money, your business doesn't grow and you don't have the life you deserve. You put all this time and effort into this. You should be rewarded. And too often you put yourself last, and that's not cool. Thank you so much for joining us today, Spencer. Amazing. Thank you, Rocky. Love what you're doing and love your messages. It's great. Um, Keep doing what you're doing. I really enjoyed the conversation with Spencer and learning about another system. It helps me 
to better help my customers. Spencer deals with larger companies than I generally do, and that's why some of them need a larger support team. The goal, though, is to help you survive and thrive, and at the end of the day, great cash flow solves a lot of problems. If either of us can help you, please reach out. I usually work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to five million in revenue. I know a lot of you don't want to deal with the numbers, and that's why I'm here, to do it for you. Because you have your zone of genius, and that's where you want to focus. I only have a few slots open at the current time, so please don't wait to connect with me because you may end up being on the waiting list. There's a scheduling link in the show notes to get on my calendar to see if I can help you and your business. If you want to learn about living the life of your dreams, check out my other podcast called Richer Soul. Just a quick reminder, you don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful. Let's focus on the bottom line and let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Let's thrive and grow. Have a profitable week.